vagyok a mai est házigazdája. A rendezvény, hát az esemény az angol nyelven fog történni, ugyanakkor magyar nyelvű feliratozást, illetve tolmácsolást elérhető, hogyha, illetve a tolmácsolás, a, hogyha a német nyelvre kattintanak, akkor az úrnak ott érhető el a, a magyar nyelvű változat. És akkor, ha megengedik, akkor én most átváltok a angol nyelve. Uh, good evening, welcome everyone. This is the uh, Republican Institute's online event on the uh, state of human rights during the second wave of the coronavirus. Uh, I'd like to greet uh, all of you who are following this event online and also our distinguished guests who've been uh, accepting our um, invitation. Uh, to date, we are going to start with the welcome speech of uh, Sharka Pratt who is the board member of the European Liberal Forum. And uh, this whole event is also supported by the European Liberal Forum. And then we are going to continue uh, with the panel discussion uh, with Natasha Briski, who is an editor-in-chief of the independent media network Metas List. Uh, we have here uh, Bajay Lenkowski, who is the president of Fundacia Liberté. Also, we are very, heap, very happy Uh, that Irina Juveva joined us, uh, a member of the European Parliament from the Renew Europe political group. Also, Shaka Pratt, uh, who is also a uh, director of the Institute for Politics and Society, is going to join the panel uh, discussion, uh, the roundtable discussion. Uh, and also, uh, Istvan Sentivani, a former uh, Hungarian ambassador to Slovenia, is going to participate in this roundtable discussion. I think it's going to be a very interesting uh, evening. Uh, and I'd like to ask you, Sharka, to, um, to hold your, uh, your, 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 your uh, opening speech. Thank you. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to welcome you on behalf of the European Liberal Forum to this online discussion regarding the effects of the pandemic on human rights. My name is Sharka Prat, and I am an elected board member of the European Liberal Forum and executive director of the Institute for Politics and Society. The European Liberal Forum brings together almost 50 liberally oriented think tanks, institutions and foundations from all over Europe and beyond. Together we are creating a space for dialogue on European integration, liberal policies, ideas and above all the future of Europe. Discussions on such topics should be encouraged in regard to the current state of affairs at this time. This year is unlike any we have experienced in modern history thanks to COVID-19. A worldwide pandemic spread like wildfire and most countries are still fighting to keep it under control as many are moving into a second wave. The various actions, especially in Central Europe, that were taken to subvert the pandemic were controversial, but generally widely accepted in the spring. However, now we are seeing the impact on human rights, economic systems and political institutions. What is the hardest hit of these? Democratic institutions and minorities. Today, we would like to focus mainly on the situation in the EU and Europe and debate the responsibility and status of basic freedoms. Each country facing the current COVID-19 pandemic is dealing differently with the dangerous situation. Some countries are doing better in this matter, while others are doing worse. The current situation raises a number of questions, especially concerning what we could do differently or why we are not better prepared or why we weren't better prepared. The first case of COVID-19 in Central Europe was found in the Czech Republic on March 1st. Within two weeks, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland and Slovakia had instituted unprecedented emergency measures to stop the spread of the virus. Borders that had remained open since EU accession in the early 2000s were slammed shut. Citizens ordered to stay home and almost all gatherings canceled. 
While these restrictions are common around the world, the central European governments have been seen as going too far and too quickly. More than anywhere else in the EU, democratic institutions in Central Europe were accused of being under threat. The largest threat to democracy COVID-19 has posted in the region are the measures governments have had to undertake in order to reduce its spread. Due to the speed and nature of the pandemic, these measures couldn't always be adequately scrutinized before they were implemented. This problem regarding institutions was initially exacerbated by citizens' tendency to rely around the flag, which gave all of the leaders in the region high approval ratings at the beginning of the crisis. At senior levels, this has given many unscrupulous politicians the ability to enact policies that benefited their immediate political desires rather than the long-term interests of their countries. At a lower level, the crisis has created the immediate necessity for huge purchases of personal protective equipment and other medical equipment. At the same time, governments have reduced the public's access to information by canceling in-person press conferences and extending freedom of information deadlines. In early March, Czech citizens overwhelmingly agree with the strong governmental measures implementing to tackle the virus. Fear and panic combined with the rapid new measures cultivated trust in government and general belief that adhering to preventative measures would mitigate the virus and life could continue normally after the first wave. Few months later though, small scale protests against the government took place in a few cities as new shutdowns were announced. These protests were primarily related to the economic impact of the severe lockdown restrictions, as well as the inability of the population to engage in what was previously accepted as daily life. The economic repercussions of the rapid governmental shutdowns has sent the global economy into a downturn. Here in Europe, local businesses have been hit hard by the mandatory closures, and many are concerned and worried about the stability of their immediate future. Beyond EU borders, however, COVID-19 has jump-started international cooperation. It has scarcely left a country or population untouched, and therefore everyone has a stake in the prevention of the spread of this virus. This has led to new cooperation between states, regions, and corporations. Countries and multinational corporations are actively working together to produce highly sought after personal protective equipment, ventilators, and soon a vaccine. The virus has presented an unprecedented challenge for the international community and it will change the landscape of globalization itself. Europe as a regional governing entity or the European Union as a regional governing entity must take a definitive stance and push for its own interests as globalization and the world stage is evolving. If the EU is able to coordinate international efforts in the wake of rising skepticism, then its position on the world stage will be solidified as a leading member driving momentum rather than deferring the to other states as drivers. Addressing this challenge as a cohesive unit could act as a push for European integration rather than states acting individually to handle the virus with varying degrees of success. On behalf of the European Liberal Forum, I wish you a pleasant discussion and I firmly believe that this event will prove fruitful, informative, and productive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saka. Thank you for the uh, addressing the, uh, the opening remarks. And uh, uh, I'd like to continue with the, with the panel discussion. Uh, and the uh, first question is, uh, we, we, are just, we are just interested, how would you evaluate the current state of democracy and human rights in your country after the various lockdown measures, now that we are 
uh, actually in the second wave uh, of the virus. And uh, well, maybe we can start with Natasha, uh, uh, please. Sorry, we can't hear you. Sorry about that. So yes, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure being with you and thank you for the invitation. Um, yes, let me first uh, update us on the current epidemiological situation in Slovenia. So we have so far performed about half a million tests. About 66,000 people have been infected with coronavirus, uh, talking about confirmed cases, uh, and there have been over 1,100 deaths recorded due to COVID-19, uh, more than 80% of them among an age group of 75 years uh, and older, according to the latest data. Uh, now, if Slovenia did a pretty good job in the spring, uh, remember, Slovenian government adopted an ordinance declaring the end of uh, the epidemic effective from uh, May 15, and uh, thus became the first country in Europe to take this step and proclaim an end to the coronavirus epidemic at home. Uh, members of the Slovenian armed forces and um, the US fighter wing even made a joint overflight uh, of Slovenia to mark the end of uh, COVID-19 epidemic. Well, that was in the spring, last month and a half, uh, couldn't be worse. In terms of deaths per million in the past week, and I am following these statistics closely for over a month now, there is no country in the world where more people die, uh, died per million inhabitants in the last week. Now we have been either number one or one of, uh, of the top five positions in the past month. Uh, I remember a friend of mine, a health worker who takes care of the patients with the most severe symptoms told me more than a month ago that uh, we are gonna be a new Bergamo, Italian city that uh, took a heavy hit in the first wave. Well, Slovenia is here now. Mortality is so much higher as it was in the spring and infections are again spreading uh, quickly in residential care homes like Slovenia. The situation is, is difficult for every country in Slovenia, even more so. Now, the reasons for a situation as such obviously depend on, on who you ask. Uh, our government with a far-right leader, Janis Janša, is Prime Minister is blaming the media on bad reporting, on not being supportive enough. Uh, the opposition for not playing their part, uh, not being constructive enough. Uh, They're blaming young people for ignoring restrictions and supposedly parting as there is no tomorrow and blaming people in general uh, uh, that uh, they are not uh, doing uh, what they should be. Now, if you ask the opposition, then the answer is the government is not doing their job good enough. Their communication skills couldn't be worse. People don't trust them. And one of the main reasons uh, that uh, so uh, low levels of trust in adopted measures and low levels of trust in, in main government uh, employees who are communicating uh, with the public. Now, the truth is probably um, somewhere in, in the middle for someone as me working in the field of journalism, communications and public relations uh, I would agree that the failure in communicating properly is of uh, epic proportions. Uh, now, uh, we are aware we were in the spring uh, as to the current status of restrictions in play. People um, were allowed to leave home as we are today only to go to work, to pharmacy, to buy groceries at the closest shop, to go outdoors and to parks, but only with people we live in the same uh, household. Uh, protective gloves, face masks are mandatory, work is in some cases suspended and uh, or reorganized, uh, and uh, strict social distancing rules are imposed. Um, now, uh, same as in March and April, uh, in an interview with uh, Mladina, 
uh, weekly in Slovenia. Um, our uh, chief epidemiolo epidemiologist uh, said he singled out mandatory masks outdoor and ban on movement between municipalities as having uh, questionable utility, but warned that overall the measures must be relaxed gradually. And uh, now the current state of democracy and human rights in our country after uh, those various lockdown measures, uh, the Human Rights Commission of the Slovenian Academy of Science and Arts issues a, a statement that decisions about anti-corona measures are autocratic, that often repressive actions which Slovenia has been seeing in recent months, as they said, do not help curb the COVID-19 pandemic, but are diverting the public from supporting the necessary and urgent measures, they said. Uh, now, they also added that the pandemic uh, undoubtedly uh, called for restrictive measures, which mostly limit human rights, but uh, it's essential that uh, these measures are well conceived and that they are within the frameworks set by the constitution. Uh, now, it's also important, uh, a couple of sentences more, it's also important how they are communicated to the public, the measures, because this is what their acceptance depends on. Now, in the first wave of the, wave of the epidemic, the government, uh, uh, for example, abused the Institute of uh, Palliative Medicine for not admitting the elderly to hospitals, while now the question of patient selection is becoming an increasingly big problem. Um, you know, uh, also writing that the government had not prepared for the second wave or strengthened the health system. Now, uh, the third wave is coming. It is uh, um, the government is is making some plans uh, also for the privatization of health. So uh, this would be like. Uh, not so short, uh, but hopefully quick summary of, of the situation in uh, Slovenia at the moment. We can't hear you. I'm so sorry, uh, it's also amateur. So Blaja, sorry, uh, what, how could you describe the, uh, the state of, uh, of democracy and human rights now during the uh, the second wave of the virus, uh, it's very interesting because uh, there actually uh, the government wanted to hold the uh, the election during the uh, the uh, uh, the virus. So uh, does it uh, how, how does it actually restrict democracy if it restricts at all? Well, I think that. Uh... What is uh, especially interesting about the situation in Poland uh, is the situation that we have uh, now since uh, last month. And I would like to uh, tell you a little bit uh, about, about this. Uh, but before uh, I will go to the actual up-to-date situation in my country, uh, I would like to out point, uh, 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 out point very, very strongly the pandemic is not conductive to maintaining a healthy democracies as people are more willing to give up many of their freedoms and liberties in the name of security. The recommended self-isolation, the inability to ensemble and meet with other citizens, as well as difficulties in organizing large-scale meetings are a great blow to the foundations of democratic civil society and solidarity uh, in self-defense against the action of the authorities. And this is uh, especially visible now in Poland. Uh, as you probably know, during the last month in Poland, we have huge, uh, really, really big demonstrations in the name of women's rights, rights against barbaric tightening of anti-abortion law by ruling law and justice party uh, and this this demonstrations uh, are of course not in the line with current uh, anti-epidemic restrictions and the government is becoming more and more aggressive in actions taken to crush these protests uh, claiming that this is against 
anti-COVID restriction, but at the same time, it's just a brutal pacification of uh, the opposition and people that are protesting against the, uh, the government and law and justice. Uh, if you see some uh, some films or some pictures from Polish from Polish streets, you can see now the police that is beating and arresting arresting protesters. Uh, these are sometimes really dramatic scenes, similar to, to to what is happening on Belarus. Maybe it is not uh, so large scale, but the the pictures are really similar. Uh, last week they have used gas against the members of Polish parliament. For example, from uh, Ms. Magdalena Biejat, a uh, member of Polish parliament, uh, or for example, the police uh, do not want to let the deputy marshal of Polish parliament, Mr. Czarzasty from opposition, to enter the building of parliament because the police were defending the parliament from, from protesters. So I think that this uh, the situation in Poland is now really, really difficult because from the one side, uh, we have um, natural anger and the law of people to protest against the very controversial law. And from the other side, we have the, uh, the matter of security uh, and uh, stopping the pandemic that is developing in Poland uh, really, really fast in the uh, last weeks. So the situation is really, really dramatic. Uh, yesterday, for example, the police have arrested the independent, quite famous journalist known from making really good reportage from, from protest, protest, protesters on, on Ukraine. So the situation in Poland is really, really difficult uh, in all, uh, all dimensions. Mm, so uh, I think that, uh, that this, this pandemic is is just making it more difficult and nobody knows how to how to solve this problem now in Poland. Thank you very much, Blaje. Uh, Irina, actually, uh, you're the one who is in the position of making political decisions. So uh, how, how is it, uh, how you see it from, uh, from your aspect, from an aspect of a, of a member of the European Parliament? Uh, we heard actually Natasha's uh, uh, interpretation and how she summed up the developments in Slovenia. Uh, how do you see these uh, very sad developments? Thank you, thank you very much. I hope you can you, you can all hear me well. Thank you, of course, for um, inviting me to be one of your uh, one of your panelists. Uh, actually, Natasha Natasha <laughs> explained or summed up pretty well um, this the situation as it was and as it still is. Um, it's a very interesting question, you know, about um, the current state of democracy and human rights in Slovenia. Uh, I will try to be brief um, because, as I said, a lot of things were already uh, been explained. Um, you know, since the beginning of the, of the pandemic, uh, there have been several measures, of course, taken uh, in order to limit uh, to limit the spreading uh, of the virus. And of course, they have there have been the sensible ones, uh, the ones that almost every European country uh, enforced, such as uh, closing the unnecessary uh, stores and the bars and the restaurants and limiting the social distancing, the mandatory wearing wearing of the masks, and so on. But uh, some measures I uh, find to be somewhat extreme. Uh, I will try to explain it on an example. Uh, in order to tackle the crisis, uh, the Slovenian government proposed uh, so-called anti-corona legislation packages, five of which have already been adopted and enforced. And the sixth one um, is currently in the process of the adoption. So, um, and the current governmental proposal, for example, includes unprecedented fine of up to 15,000 euros for everyone who will publicly on social platforms criticize and question the governmental actions um, to tackle the corona crisis. They are trying to legitimize it by saying that such criticism is a form of endangering uh, public health, but I think that it's actually a clear example of apparent abuse of the current crisis. Uh, you know, it's a mean of repression against Slovenian citizens and 
an absolutely excessive and disproportionate measure. It's only one example and I see it as a clear violation of the human rights as the question was about that. Um, and also violation, you know, the freedom of speech is a Slovenian constitutional category and punishing people who express their opinion in order to silence the voices of despondent people with opposing views is, in my opinion, a downfall of any democracy. Uh, so therefore, I would unfortunately have to say or to evaluate the current state of democracy and human rights in Slovenia um, as uh, slowly degrading. And Natasha already explained why. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Irina. Uh, Istvan, uh, we heard that the uh, uh, Slovenian government uh, uh, had new legislations, uh, which uh, supposedly because of protecting us and uh, the Slovenian people from the virus, but these are also dismantling democracy. But the Hungarian government even had time to change the constitution. Uh, uh, so how would you evaluate the state of democracy and human rights during uh, the second wave of the virus. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much for inviting me for this interesting panel and, and discussion. And let me start with that, that we have a, a very low level of human rights at the beginning. That means that the initial position of Hungary is also very, uh, very low and poor. And uh, in comparison to the other countries, it's, it, it, it has been very much curtailed and, and damaged during the first and also to the, the second wave. I would like to concentrate only on the second wave, but even in the first wave, that was some strong restrictions on human rights. One of the Hungary has been hit not by not only by the virus, but also by the by the government measures, which uh, used or abused the possibility to curtailing the, the basic and human rights. Of course, there are some uh, restrictions and some measures which are really related to the, uh, to the coronavirus or the combating and curtailing, uh, curbing the coronavirus. I can understand it that uh, these are the, the restrictions on the free movement of people. These are the restrictions of uh, assembly of, of the people. However, I think in Hungary, it's, it's much more severe and strict than in, in many other countries. Up to 10 persons are allowed to, to have an assembly and not more, which is, which is, is very soon. And it has been punished uh, very much during the time of the first wave when there has taken place some demonstrations against the, the measures and against the government. Then uh, the people have got very high uh, uh, very, uh, very high uh, fines, some of them around 3,000 euros only for participation at the demonstration in, in Hungary. But uh, there are some that I, I think more or less have been introduced in most, most of the European countries. However, however it has been uh, treated in, in Hungary in a more brutal way, on the, on the more uh, violent way, but, but I, I it has been legitimized at least in the eyes of the people that it is it is necessary it is reasonable they need some some restrictions uh, during the lockdown but uh, they used the, the opportunity to uh, to introduce a first a state of uh, emergency it has been declared on on 30 of, of march and at the beginning it has been declared for an indefinite period of time that means that there was no any time limitation uh, which caused and prompted public anger and, and concerns well, what will happen. And of course, uh, during this, uh, this uh, state of emergency, practically they ruled by decrees. Originally, they planned to bypass the parliament, but later on, uh, after the strong protest uh, uh, within the country and abroad, they withdrew to, to the position and withdrew this position and, and at the end, uh, the parliament has worked, but many important things have been uh, ordered and, and commanded by, by decrees and the decrees can, could not be uh, uh, appealed or challenged. Uh, 
Uh, there are many, many restrictions have been introduced. Only uh, let me take only a few examples for that. For instance, the uh, the legis a new legislation or a new decree has been uh, has been issued for the so-called fake news. Uh, that means that uh, that was a very strict uh, legislation. Up to five years jail has been foreseen for those who are spreading fake news, uh, but the fake news was a very, very elastic notion uh, in that uh, legislation. It means it could be also a true fact. And that was some literal cases where true fact has been spreaded and, and the people have been, uh, have been uh, fined and, and punished by that. For instance, someone uh, uh, made a, a Facebook entry on the true number of the infected people in the local hospital, and it has been uh, accused that he is spreading fake news. But the fake news is that which is which is uh, possibly uh, preventing or the or the hindering the uh, the, the protection and the, the the fight against the coronavirus and so on. That that was the the very elastic uh, definition of the fake news. That means that practically everything could be fake news, but it has been considered. That was one of the things, but, but we can put aside because it, it, it is uh, more or less. That was some, some other restrictions on, on human rights. Uh, first in May and second now that you indicated, and I, I will talk about that, the, the um, ninth amendment of the Hungarian constitution. Uh, it, is, it is obvious that's one of the target uh, group of the, uh, the restrictions uh, is the LMBTQ community. First in, in May has been uh, adopted adopted a legislation which made practically uh, practically impossible to change the legal status of the birth gender. It's, it's against the so-called transgender, transgender and intersex uh, people. And that means that everyone uh, has a birth gender which has been registered to, uh, by the birth and, and cannot be changed anymore in the, in the official documents, which is a, a obvious uh, violation of the basic rights. And, and even more now, there is a new amendment to the constitution, which uh, would like to, uh, to uh, ban the adoption by the same-sex couples. However, the, uh, the description of the, of the legislation is, is that, that a single cannot, be, cannot adopt a child, but practically is mainly targeting the same-sex couple. As you know, in Hungary, the, uh, officially, the same-sex couple uh, couldn't and cannot uh, adopt a child, but usually there's the practice that one of them as a single, one of their partner, the same-sex partner as a single, adopt a child. That has been practically banned, only one few exemptions with the specific permit of the minister, personally from the minister can adopt. And that means that it is targeted basically and mainly on the, the, the same-sex couples, but also the, the normal singles, the, the normal, the non-same-sex single are targeted by the same law and, and it, it will be, will be um, uh, solidified and consolidated in the parliament, most, uh, in the so-called constitution or the basic law in Hungary, but that is practically the, 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 the Hungarian constitution. Uh, there are some other delicacies in the, in the Hungarian uh, practice in the last uh, half year and, and specifically in the, in the, in, in the last uh, months. For instance, they introduce a new, uh, new uh, stipulation or the regulation on the public funds, uh, which practically means that the, the government can channel the public fund, funds into the private funds, and it is protected by the, uh, by the constitution. That means that this uh, is properties, this has been channeled out from the public into the private. The, of course, the government closed private funds, it cannot be taken away or taken back only with, uh, with the change of the constitution of the, 
the basic law, that means it's almost almost impossible, only two thirds. And and the third one, which is a, a, a strict, uh, it's it's a very concerning and worrisome restriction uh, now, just today, as a very fresh uh, fresh news that it has been even even said that uh, they have changed, they constitutionally changed uh, the election. Election law, and according to electoral election law, the national list can be set up only. Originally, it has been submitted with uh, 51 um, one candidates, but now there is a new uh, amendment. Today has been submitted and and in the in the committee uh, adopted with 71. Um, uh, can, uh, candidates, which means that they would like to uh, prevent the smaller parties and regional parties to set up a list. Practically, they cannot have a party list because it's all in all, there are 106 uh, positions in the, in the party list, uh, 106, uh, 106 uh, districts. And you need to have 71 candidate in 71 district, and only in that case you can have a, a party list, which is obviously it's 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 a it's a very crude uh, crude attack on the on the basic rights and and, and right of for election. And uh, and so on. I, I don't know what will be the, the final vote. It's it it will be foreseen in 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 December, but now it, it seems to be that it's, it's, it's very restricted. And of course, we can talk about the, uh, the human rights in a, in a broader sense, that's, uh, which is also uh, protected by several international uh, conventions and treaties. That's the, the right to the health, uh, the good health. So in, in that uh, respect, uh, the Hungarian government made many inadequate uh, measures and, and uh, going against that. The, the whole sector, the health sector in Hungary is, is underfinanced very much. Uh, the health spending in Hungary, it's less than 5% of the GDP. However, the European average is around 8%. <clears throat> that means that it's very under underfinanced and, and unprepared for the uh, for the coronavirus, even unprepared for the second wave. It has been uh, has uh, has been made uh, only a, a very few tests and very few countermeasures which could curb curbing the, the coronavirus. Uh, in, in April, it has been freed up 32,000 uh, hospital beds. It's more than 60% of the all hospital beds in Hungary. And many patients, even some serious patients have been sent back home uh, as, a, uh, as a preparation for receiving the, uh, the COVID uh, cases. However, the, the, the total uh, cases at that time, not now, now it's much higher, but at that time that was 1,200 who have been in, in hospitals uh, in Hungary, but 32,000 hospital beds have been em emptied practically and freed up and many, many uh, patients have been sent back. I think it's, it's also a severe uh, violation of the, of the basic uh, human rights. And, and uh, even now that uh, many don't, don't have a, a good access to the, to the treatment and, and so on. All in all, the, the situation is, is severe. I wouldn't like to compete with my, my Polish colleagues. I know that the problems are also, also very serious and severe in Poland, but I think that we are more or less on the same pace and on the same, same situation. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Istvan. Uh, Sherka, do you see any differences between the first wave and the second wave when it comes to uh, the democratic consequences and the state of human rights in the Czech Republic. What is the situation actually uh, there now? Yeah, well, uh, definitely we have completely different reactions regarding the second wave than we had regarding the first wave. Uh, while the first wave of COVID-19's public uh, and political perception uh, varied greatly by state, but the general attitude was one of uh, uh, uncertainty, concern, and in many cases, panic. 
policy was uh, enacted very quickly to send thousands of people into unprecedented lockdown. And due to panic of the unknown and fear, many people gladly complied and countries and economies grinded to a halt. Uh, scare population is more accepting of rapid changes. So if they are marketed as protective measures and in many cases uh, are not questioned until after the effect. And in the second wave, however, skepticism and protests were much more common as uh, life during a pandemic was more and more part of the daily existence. And social media especially produced many questions about the first wave so uh, measures through memes and uh, other quickly spread uh, mediums. Uh, for example, if the first lockdown was successful, why do we need a second one? Uh, followed by, if the first lockdown wasn't successful, why do we need a second one? Uh, moving into the second wave, COVID-19 uh, has been the reality we have all left with for almost a year and uh, has seen an exponential drop in the fear and uh, panic we saw during the first wave. Uh, so this has led to more rational questioning of measures and their impacts and their pros and cons, uh, thereby reducing their effectiveness so if measures are needed to contain the spread. If the measures are not needed, then implementing them when fear is no longer the dominating factor will reduce the approval and the trust in government. Uh, well, and as for the uh, political approach in the second wave, we are seeing a much more hesitant approach to lockdown measures for an extended period of time, if at all. Uh, this is because politicians and states cannot afford to support businesses with aid packages or funding to keep them open. Uh, the health of the economy, uh, both micro and macro, are the central focus of legislators and politicians uh, the second time around. Uh, but uh, if I should uh, say, like, uh, if there was a really uh, human rights, so no, if, if we damage like human rights. So, well, the fact is that all Visegra countries have reduced personal freedoms and uh, enacted legislation that gives the executive more power. The crisis has reduced uh, scrutiny for government actions, uh, caused governments to reduce personal data protections uh, and has allowed Chinese attempts to use the virus to cement its influence in the region. And the first COVID case in the Czech Republic was discovered in Prague on March 1st and two weeks later on March 13th, the Czech government enacted a state of emergency. This involved many unprecedented restrictions, including restrictions on movement for non-essential purposes, limitations on non-family gatherings, uh, the closing of non-essential business, a ban on most foreign arrivals, and most controversially, a ban on uh, Czech citizens leaving the country. Um, the most severe restrictions included banning meetings of more than two non-family members, mandating the wearing of a mask uh, in all public spaces, and closing the borders to almost all travel. And uh, well, another necessity is a more concrete potential for redu reduction of freedom is contact tracing applications which have become essential for fighting the virus. And these applications uh, can store immense amounts of data about their users. In a worst case scenario for privacy, uh, governments could use mandatory centralized contact tracing apps, uh, which could create a full database of their residents' movements and contacts. And privacy rights activists fear that in such a scenario, governments will abuse access to data. While all tracing apps in the region are voluntary, some governments have already made some worrying decisions about personal data as prior applications have been known to store location data on a central server. But overall, the coronavirus has so weakened the Czech public's ability to hold the government accountable and potentially open the door to some less than scrupulous uh, maneuvers by the ruling government. Uh, there has been no significant scapegoating or human rights violations. 
and the virus has a substantial uh, weakened Czech democracy or liberalism in the Czech Republic. Thank you very much, Shaka, uh, for the um, for the inputs. We've been now, uh, until now, we've been discussing the immediate and uh, the direct uh, lockdown measures and how it affected democracy and human rights uh, in uh, our region. Uh, but as a matter of fact, already in the springtime, people already discussed the possible economic effects of, of the lockdown measures uh, and of the coronavirus as well. So I'm curious in this round, uh, what's your opinion about the long lasting effects, uh, uh, economic effects uh, uh, on the, the, uh, the lockdowns and the, and the coronavirus effect on the, on the employment? Um, because now actually we are uh, we are doing our job online. Uh, we are holding a conference online, so it could actually also change how people are working. But also uh, maybe in the next months we are going to have one of the saddest Christmas uh, in Europe uh, and and a very quiet and and uh, lonely New Year's Eve. So possibly there are also mental. Uh, effects of this of this lockdown. So, what do you think? Uh, can we actually at all now evaluate, uh, or or can we actually just guess the possible effects? And what do you think? What is going to be long lasting? At what is going to be just a just a bad memory? Irina, please, if you would uh, give us your inputs. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I know this is going to be a wishful thinking, but I, I really sincerely hope that uh, there won't be any bigger negative long lasting uh, effects of the lockdown and, you know, the social distancing on, on the human rights and uh, democracy. Um, but of course, it's very hard uh, for all of us, as you said, um, not only economically, but also physically or mentally, because uh, at least, uh, you know, when you respect all the measures, as I do, and you're at home all the time, the only thing that I'm doing is I go for a quick walk that's once in two days and that's it. And the only um, contact that I have is the contact with my partner. So, because we live together. So um, it's, uh, I don't know, I really do hope that it will all be a bad memory in, in, in a few months, but um, unfortunately we are all able to see that the decline um, also in the democracy and in the human rights field uh, because of the current situation. And, but the battle, um, the battle for human rights and democracy uh, has been fought for centuries and we have not yet even achieved their full potential uh, and it's being damaged and uh, repairing the damage will, the ma damage made will be of course, extremely difficult. Uh, one of the main problems in decline of the democracy during this pandemic is, in my opinion, the repression of, of the media and the so-called infodemic we are facing. Uh, and we need to ensure the flow, um, the flow of the information form decisions made to the public is ensured by um, unbiased and independent uh, journalists while also having, of course, transparent media um, ownership. Twitter and the other social media I think they cannot be the main source uh, of information. As, as for the employment and uh, the economy, I think, of course, they will be strongly affected by these lockdown measures. We don't even realize the consequences yet, I think. Um, there has been already a considerable decree, uh, increase of the unemployment in the recent months as the consumer cantered business have been mostly shut down, especially the smaller, the, the family businesses who had no means to adapt to the situation, but also the bigger ones uh, who have adapted, but now need uh, fewer workers um, because of the different workload, of course. And um, the economy, unfortunately, does not look promising um, as the global stock market uh, reported that the COVID crisis caused the steepest fall since the uh, since the 2008 um, financial crisis, surpassing actually the lowest point of the 2008. Um, nevertheless, uh, you know, even though it seems like we are about to enter an unpleasant era, I do believe that we can concur uh, anything that we, we will be able to overcome everything that we are about to be um, faced with. I mean, we have to be optimistic because otherwise we will all 
all lose our minds. So I really hope for better times soon. Thank you. I, I hope that the, uh, the takeaway of this conference will be a big bag of optimism. Uh, Blasher, what do you think, uh, what could be the, uh, the long lasting effect if we consider various factors, uh, politics, uh, uh, the uh, actually the mental health of society, which could be also very important uh, because maybe actually these uh, illiberal regimes are trying to dismantle democracy because they think that people care about different issues. So what do you think, what could be the long lasting effect? Well, uh, generally I'm not uh, optimist. Uh, firstly, uh, I would like to say uh, that this all radical steps uh, with profound economic and social consequences violating the citizens uh, of uh, and uh, rights of citizens, uh, in my opinion, have not brought the expected results, uh, especially uh, in Poland. I think that it is similar in majority of countries in Europe. Uh, lockdown measures taken uh, in the spring uh, have not solved any of our problems. Uh, in Poland, at the end of September, and especially in October and November, the number of infections began to increase significantly. So hopes that the lockdown would stop the virus permanently, uh, which from the very beginning, in my opinion, were based on the wrong assumptions, have proven to be simply a kind of something completely illusory. Uh, lockdown only uh, gives us a very short window of time for better preparation of the health service, uh, while at the same time radically limiting the revenues of the state and local governments. So uh, without this finances, without expansion of taxes, the expansion of health service potential in the long run will not be possible. So we should remember that we are just uh, buying some time by lockdown and we are not solving the problem. Uh, I, I, we, we don't know what will happen next year. The government is Pol in Poland is not giving uh, transparent information about the budget situation for the next year, but from the old signals, we can imagine that it will be extremely difficult budget. Uh, for example, influence uh, influences revenues of local governments. We know that it dropped significantly. Many measures of of cities from Poland are starting to talk about backing to the situation from the 90s in terms of constructing the budgets for for the next year. It's a really, really dramatic situation. Uh, during the second wave of pandemic, the Polish government is imposing new and new restrictions on our freedoms and also on economic activities. Uh, probably uh, the short and the strict lockdown on the beginning of November was needed to help the healthcare system to, to survive. Uh, but uh, in Poland, uh, this lockdown is long and it's not strict. It is not based on data. Uh, we don't know why the government is closing this sector and the other is not closed. For example, we have closed all restaurants or pubs, all sports and cultural fa uh, facilities, including, for example, libraries. But for example, casinos are open or government just decided to open big shopping, mall, shopping malls. Uh, I really don't know why shopping gallery is less dangerous than, for example, library on the theater. So, so it is no consequences in government actions. I think that the scale of the crisis will be visible fully uh, on February, on March, when uh, numerous of small uh, family businesses just will go bankrupt. Uh, many economists in Poland uh, um, predict that uh, lockdown, that many small, small enterprises can survive lockdown for three or four months. If it will be longer, it will be absolutely devastating and probably it will be happening uh, in Poland. I think that the only one good thing is that this awkward and unsuccessful activities of law and justice 
made their endorsement result uh, among people lower. And I think that it will be a constant trend that they will be uh, 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 will not have so so big uh, people's uh, support. Mm. At the end, uh, I think that uh, uh, I would like to also present you some kind of uh, new strategy elements that should be should, could help to combat a pandemic. In my opinion, uh, firstly, uh, according to the uh, Great Barrington Declaration, we should focus on protection of the elderly and those from high risk groups like cancer patients. Uh, secondly, uh, we should uh, try to make uh, possibly normal life for people from low risk groups, which allows them to be in infected and to come closer to herd immunity, which will save the state from a complete economic collapse and the great social, uh, social educational and cultural crisis. We should change our uh, attitude to, to lockdowns. Uh, lockdowns should be pre-planned for the whole next year should be radical, but really short, like three weeks, uh, uh, to to help to to save this uh, healthcare capacity system. And at the same time, we should systematically uh, raise the capacity of healthcare systems uh, and combine it with radical improvement of efficiency of administration systems, like management of free beds in hospitals, digitalization of epidemiological inspection in Poland, or really improve the resource management systems. I think that these four steps could, could help to solve this very difficult situation uh, next year when we will be waiting still for the efficient uh, vaccine vaccination. Thank you. Thank you very much, Plage. Uh, we are going to come back to this, to uh, policy effectiveness uh, and how to handle the current situation. Uh, Sharka, so my question is the uh, is the same. Uh, there's been a, uh, a rather optimistic uh, opinion, and and Plage was probably more realistic on the uh, possible economic outcomes of the. Of the uh, of the pandemic, uh, what do you think about uh, about the uh, long-lasting uh, economic social effects of uh, of this current uh, uh, pandemic? Yeah, well, well I, I think that the largest long-lasting effect of the pandemic and the lockdown measures are the economic impacts and the change of every individual's daily life. Uh, because life after the pandemic is one of in and out of pandemic measures. And COVID-19 was the first, but it won't be the last. And uh, governments uh, and international institutions and corporations after the current pandemic must have a plan in place and we must learn how to cope and cooperate with one another to mitigate a second pandemic or SARS-based or uh, otherwise. Uh, the global economy and overall employment cannot survive more lockdown measures and the landscape of our global economy will be altered forever as globalization faces a major setback. The inability to travel means uh, goods, services, labor, and capital will have a will have a harder time moving around, and therefore leaving states uh, to be more self-sufficient uh, than they have had to be in the last uh, decades. Not to mention the detriment and forced uh, vulnerability of democracy and human rights in regards to state versus individual rights. One of the central questions facing the democracies uh, of the world uh, post pandemic is uh, how many rights uh, do states have with the intention of disease prevention and uh, how many rights do individuals have to exist within the state including freedom of movement. 
uh, how do states ensure their present uh, and future integrity and preserve their economy so while still balancing human rights and maintaining the infrastructure of democracy like political norms uh, in the future democracies and especially citizens must be aware of the risk of populist politicians and demagogues who will seek power and use pandemic prevention uh, measures as an uh, excuse to grab power, uh, shift or delay elections and potentially topple democracy altogether. Thank you very much, Shaka. Uh, Natasha, uh, we are actually journalists, but also political scientists, analysts. Uh, we used to, to work actually from home uh, with only just an internet connection. Uh, how do you see actually when we when we discuss, because we also discuss the economy and the, the labor market, but what about the way we work? Uh, what do you think it's, it's going to just, uh, uh, everyone are, are now going to work on a freelancer basis or is it is it some kind of long lasting effect which is going to change how we do our job and even more and more people should be more uh, uh, just to be, uh, uh, they, they should actually cope with the fact that uh, that they are sometimes they are forced to work from home, and then they should be more flexible than they were before. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, uh, things have uh, quite changed uh, since March. Uh, I had many conferences uh, that uh, I should attend uh, during this past uh, couple of months in person live. Uh, it's every everything been now on on Zoom or uh, similar uh, platforms. Um, there have been uh, like many short or long lasting effects on top of what uh, Madam Yaveva already said. Uh, from a psychological point of view, the crisis has been uh, quite hard on the people in the first half uh, of uh, 2020, the National Institute of Public Health uh, recorded a rise in number of antidepressant prescriptions issued in the uh, and the number of persons who received at least one prescription for, for antidepressant between uh, March and, and, uh, and May. And they are saying that the epidemic likely will have an impact. Uh, uh, lockdowns uh, to contain the, the coronavirus led to the spikes in domestic violence, uh, uh, as the reports show. Uh, COVID-19 wave of violence against women shows that the uh, EU countries still lack proper safeguards, in Slovenia being uh, no exception. And experts who are working uh, in this field are noticing a rise in domestic violence. Now, for a healthy democracy, as you mentioned, uh, one needs healthy media situation. Now, for almost uh, eight months, uh, the prime minister and his SDS party constantly and consistently target journalists and the members of the media. Now, the prime minister in May even published uh, an essay, uh, War with the Media on governmental websites. Uh, the government proposed changes to media laws, controversial uh, legislative amendments to the public broadcaster and the press agency. Now, thanks to the widespread protests and criticism from, from international bodies, the government subject, subjected the bills to a meaningful public consultation uh, and have not yet succeeded in implementing the desired changes. Uh, they are desperately trying to fire the CEO of the national radio television broadcaster, uh, which uh, would pave uh, the way for a wider reaching changes that might affect the independency uh, of the broadcaster. It's absolutely true that some uh, are saying uh, the few countries uh, in Europe have experienced uh, such a swift downturn in press and media freedom after a new government came to power than in Slovenia under veteran uh, Prime Minister uh, Janis Janša. Now, I checked uh, some of the surveys as to how many people uh, support the government and it shows, as opposed during the, the first wave, that uh, the number of people who do not support the government work is on the rise, but you were also asking about the, the long lasting effects. And there's been an interesting survey out 
uh, talking about also public reactions and the long lasting possible changes. Now, uh, the social hardship of individuals in Slovenia has been mitigated by the uh, provisional introduction of a basic monthly income and a one of solidarity bonus. Uh, the basic monthly income for March was 350 euros for April and May 700 euros that was paid to uh, self employed persons, to farmers, to company members and employees of uh, religious organizations and the one of solidarity bonus was paid in different amounts depending on uh, the recipient. Now, could be that the idea of um, basic monthly income is becoming more and more popular now that now that people have got that bonus. Uh, so the survey was published yesterday and as many as 48% of respondents uh, in a Valicon survey supports the introduction of universal basic income in Slovenia as opposed to 14% who oppose it. Um, the rest are either undecided or, or think they are not uh, informed well enough. So the idea is most popular in, among voters uh, of the opposition left, but nevertheless talking about um, uh, basic income uh, has uh, it's been more, more frequent. Um, now, as for long-lasting effects, some express concerns that the country is faced uh, uh, with the threat of uh, a fast deterioration in the economic situations. Uh, the ones who are uh, especially hard hit uh, are uh, those working in the field of tourism, restaurants, travel, culture, entertainment sector, uh, and uh, the auto industry. Uh, now, to be honest, the government, as uh, uh, Irina Jovev already said, adopted several packages to, to help the economy, to what success we shall see, to, to what, um, how it will uh, shape the future of our work, uh, we shall see. Uh, but there's a growing feel that the economic crisis, the people are speculating it might happen in a couple of months, is going to be even more severe as health related consequences. And talking about the long distance learning as well, schools in Slovenia are forced to organize distance learning. Now it's been going on and off since March and uh, disproportionately hit at the moment are children from poorer families who do not have uh, computers. Some in rural areas do not have proper internet connections. Uh, some families have all sorts of other struggles uh, which affect children as well. The Slovenian constitution stipulates that all students get the same access to education, meaning the school must be the same for everybody. Now that is, uh, I know the situation is hard, but that is not the case at the moment as everyone is, is struggling with the, the new situation bestowed upon us by COVID-19. So uh, no question at all for me as uh, someone working in the field of journalism and communications, now um, all of the work has been uh, with the help of Zoom or, or similar platforms. The effects uh, will, I don't think we will go back. I have many friends who have been commuting on a daily basis to Brussels. Uh, I think they will also see some positive, positive effects of the, uh, the crisis. Um, not necessarily, you know, every uh, meeting needs to be in person. Uh, we shall see also how damaging the, it will be to uh, the respect for human rights, democracy. Uh, currently, it seems that the situation is uh, talking about Slovenia. I think it's quite similar everywhere, everywhere else. It's quite liquid, still chaotic and uh, fast changing. But I think that uh, we will uh, never again in many fields go back to uh, where we were at the beginning of this year or last year. Thank you very much. Uh, we have two questions here concerning the EU and Irina Yuva has to leave uh, at uh, 18.15. So if you don't mind, uh, we are going to uh, start with these two questions. Uh, of course, all right. Uh, Irina, because she has, to, she has to leave. So the first question is, uh, it says that Hungary closed its borders, other countries did not like that. Is there any kind of uh, common EU regulation on that? 
uh, in general, what is your opinion about the uh, common uh, pandemic related regulation? So this is the, uh, the first question. And the second question, the new EU budget, so the debate over the new EU budget because of that, uh, uh, countries can't take uh, the can take uh, the uh, the credit loan uh, from credit institutions. Uh, and because of this delay, uh, can it harm the effective uh, 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 steps uh, against the economic crisis? So because of this delay, because of the uh, of this, I think the. Uh, the anonymous attendees thought about the veto of, uh, of from the side of Poland and Hungary. Okay, thank you very much. I'm I'm really sorry, but uh, I really do have to have to leave in a few minutes, so I will try to briefly answer to the both questions. If I understood the first one correctly, um, there is no common regulation about the borders, but there are there are um, common advises if you if you want me to say it like that uh in on the european uh, level because you know every i mean we know that we have schengen and everything else but at the end of the day it's the country that decides uh what it wants to do and we all saw especially in the first wave that every country was um also selfishly you know um uh, doing uh, closing or opening the borders by some political decisions that were not um, connected with um, expert decisions or something like that. But uh, now there are a few uh, bigger steps, especially on the common regulation about the uh, um, methodology for the um, for the epidemic uh, situation around the Europe. So we have a methodology and the, the Re European Commission also announced um, a European Health Union that will also try to, to arrange, especially the health, uh, the health issues on the European level so that not the countries um, will be deciding by themselves. Also, of course, uh, the vaccines are, um, going to be um, bid and you know um, solidarily uh, given to the states um, on the European level. So at the beginning, of course, there were no common um, steps, but uh, now, I mean, quite quickly actually, if we if we look back on the refugee crisis, for example, in this crisis, the the reaction was quite quicker than than before in the European level. So now we have some common uh, common rules if if you want um, to, to, tack, to tackle the crisis. Uh, regarding the budget, unfortunately, I have to say that yes, the delay will harm the ev everyone, you know, everyone in the European Union. The two countries are blocking it, but the harm will be done to the every citizen that lives in the European Union. Um, because, you know, the countries borrowed financial means to, to, to mitigate the effects, but it's not enough. So this budget is really, really, really important. And also because it's really big, you know, we're talking about 1.8 trillion euros. That's, I mean, a historic opportunity uh, for, for um, this money to be used uh, to, to tackle with the crisis and also, of course, the Green Deal digitalization and everything else, but especially uh, for the recovery and resilience. Uh, that's why we have the new fund. So uh, not being able to access such, such an unimaginable, actually, amount of money, uh, which would undoubtedly, I think, improve uh, the quality of lives of our citizens. It would help the, the companies and everything else. Um, I think it's it would be utterly irresponsible and it would almost seem like undeserved punishment for the citizens because of the, the veto and the blockade. So, uh, I mean, every EU country, of course, needs the funds, all, including Hungary and Poland, and um, uh, their governments are obviously willing to sacrifice their own uh, citizens' uh, well-being because of the anti-corruption mechanism agreed by the European institution. It's all said with that. I really do hope that we will find a compromise and a deal um, soon enough. Uh, but, you know, um, 
it's hard to be optimistic at, at this time about it, but I really, really do hope that they will see that it's harming everyone. So they will um, put their selfish um, thoughts and political thoughts, internal thoughts on, on the side. I really do hope. Thank you. Uh, thank you for in uh, Europe and thank you for being with us. Uh, we wish you uh, a lot of success with uh, with uh, tackling the uh, this, this virus and and to work uh, together and finding a compromise with uh, with others. And uh, Istvan, uh, maybe the the situation in the EU nowadays and uh, uh, this veto is is in a long lasting effect uh, in itself. So uh, just I'd like to put together the, these two questions. Uh, what are the long lasting effects in your opinion? And how would you evaluate uh, the veto of Hungary and Poland? Uh, how can it affect uh, the, uh, the situation of these two, the veto countries and, uh, and, of, uh, and the, the, the whole of Europe? And how could it, well, it's, it possibly it's going to be going to delay the effective handling of the crisis as well. Thank you. May I start with veto? I think that's a topical issue now. It's it's been a, possibly it's more interesting than the than the other. And, and my colleagues uh, have told so many good things. That's only a short remarks I would like to make on the on the on the first question. But on on the veto, I see a, a bit different way as uh, than, uh, than Irina said. I, I think so far that was no delay practically because uh, the decision is foreseen on the uh, European Council summit, uh, which is uh, taking place on December, 10th and 11th of December. And my educated guess that it will be a compromise until then. And frankly, honestly speaking, I am very much afraid of that compromise. Uh, I, I, I have seen some statements on on behalf mostly on the on the German politicians from Merkel, Heiko Haas, and Manfred Weber, and all are going in the direction that they would like to give in to the veto governments. They are not countries. I, I have to make uh, clear and make it, make it clear and 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 very uh, strong on that, that it's not the countries are, are we going to veto, but, but the governments going to veto for, for selfish interests. And, and it would be a big, big failure and mistake to make a so-called compromise with those governments, because those governments practically and, and, and basically wouldn't like to veto. They agree with the, with the two, uh, two major financial instruments, the next generation and the, the multi-annual financial framework, but they would like to get rid of the, the rule of law mechanism and rule of law uh, uh, procedure, which is going against them. However, I think it's the stake is very high. The stake is the credibility of the European Union. If the European Union give in and make a bad compromise, it, it sounds that there is one of the compromises that they would like to stop and, and halt the, the seven, uh, Article 7 procedure. However, I, I know that the Article 7 procedure uh, did not bring so much and won't bring anything because uh, the, uh, the two countries can, uh, can save each other uh, with, the, with the rules, but, but at least it has a symbolic importance. It is stopped, that means that Europe uh, retreated and accepted that there is no systemic problems with the uh, rule of law in Hungary and in Poland, which is not true. It's a systemic uh, problem with uh, rule of law in Hungary and, and Poland, and it has to be maintained. It's, it's a very important thing. Another uh, other element of the compromise, which we can uh, hear about it, that they would like to make possible to, to appeal to the Court of uh, Justice, the European Court of Justice, uh, the decision. What's the problem with it? Of course, basically, it's not problematic because Court of Justice is it's an independent court uh, uh, in Luxembourg, and, and I don't have any afraid, uh, I don't have any concern about it, and I think they, they make a good decision. The only problem is that it has a long, long delay of the procedure. That means usually it's three, four years 
last a, a, a long procedure until the end and the valid uh, ruling of the of the court. And that means that uh, the, these governments can have three, four more years. They can do whatever they want, and they can get an access to the to the financial uh, uh, sources uh, without any any restrictions. And once it uh, it will be charged by the European Court. There is the case of the. Uh, Hungary and, and uh, Poland is uh, affected. The case of the asylum seekers re re relocation case. You, you remember that Hungary, Poland, and also Slovakia uh, refused to take over the asylum seekers according to the quota, the relocation quota. And this summer, 2020, has been validly and, and lastly ruled by the European Court this case. And it is absolutely uh, no sense about it. Of course, they, they lost the two governments, the Hungarian and Polish governments, but now there is no, re no scheme, no re relocation. That means that it has, has no effect. Now, good. Therefore, uh, I, I think that it will be a compromise, and I am not, I'm not uh, happy about that. I think it would be much better to, to adopt as soon as possible the, uh, the regulation. On the uh, on the rule of law uh, procedure, and and then the two governments uh, should uh, take a decision on that whether they reject the the two financial instruments or not, and it is not linked anymore to the to the rule of law things because the rule of law things anyway will be valid from first of January next year. Uh, whether they uh, adopt, uh, accept uh, the two financial instruments or veto, that that would be, I think, the the, the uh, reasonable act on behalf of the rest of Europe, the twenty five member states. But I am afraid that's not the case. Very short, uh, very brief on the on the on the first question. I think everything depends on that on the impact and effect of the of the coronavirus or the pandemic. Uh, I, I think it depends very much on that how long does it take and how do, long does it last. If it lasts more than uh, next spring or, or, or even more, I don't know how long, long, then it will have a very severe and long lasting effects. If it will be overcome in the next spring, I think it uh, anyway it will have an effect and impact on the economy and on many other things, but not so radical and not so uh, strong effect. Of course, the home uh, office at home working and distant working will be wide, wide, widespread, I think. Not, not every sectors are hit by the same, uh, same way. Uh, of course, we know that, for, is, for instance, tourism and air, air travel and airline industry is very much hit. It's, it's, it, I think it will be a very long way to cure. Some of the other industries are not, not so much and for instance, there are some of them which are which are rocketing and, and flying high. For instance, the web shop industry, it's now it's up and all digital things are going up. And, and therefore it's it's a it's a very uh, very complex uh, picture, but I think that it will be a rearrangement. The, uh, the economy will be not the same as it has been. My second point on the globalization, there is an ongoing debate on the, uh, on the issue whether China is the, the winner or the loser of the process. And there are strong arguments, both of them, and I wouldn't like to decide this, that debate, but I think that's, uh, that's an important issue. Of course, in globalization will be some changes, some globalization that are talking about that, that it's, it's uh, slowing down, and the supply chains will be shortened. I'm almost sure of that. It will be shortened and, and some of them will be relocated and, and back, bringing back, or at least bringing closer to the, to the consumer uh, markets, or to Europe and to United States and so on, from uh, Southeast Asia and from, from China as, as well. And therefore, I, I think it has a, an impact, but there, there is an argument therefore that China can can be uh, can be one of the winner of the process. China is one of the only leading economic uh, power, which which most probably will have an economic growth by the end of the years, very slight, two three percent, but at least growth. All others have. 5%, 8%, uh, 6% uh, drop and, and downturn, and, and China is the only one. And, and we will see that that will be an important uh, important uh, 
uh, area where, where we should focus very much on that, uh, the globalization. And my last, uh, last short remark on the populism. Many hoped that the populism will have a, a, a big defeat during the, uh, uh, due to the corona, coronavirus and the pandemic. And there are some good examples for that. There are some argumentation that even uh, President Trump uh, have been defeated due, partly due to the coronavirus, the inadequate treatment of, of the coronavirus. We see that Bolsonaro have fa has failed very much also. Erdogan struggled, uh, struggling, uh, Erdogan and Putin and the others, all the, 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 the major figures of the populist movement of the world, including uh, Mr. Orban, are uh, struggling very hard with the issue. And uh, now is, is, uh, is, uh, has become more clear that the, the populism is not a method. It's an incompetent, inadequate uh, method to, to treat the, the situation caused by the coronavirus and, and uh, pandemic. And it, it has become uh, well known now to the, to the public. And therefore, everywhere can, uh, can be seen a downturn of the pop populism and the popularity of the populism, even in Hungary. Uh, after many years, that's the first time that the combined opposition has uh, overcome uh, the Fidesz. That's, however, in the, in the first wave, which has been perceived uh, by the Hungarian public opinion that is more or less all right and that's uh, good uh, and well treated by the government, uh, Fidesz could have two, three percent uh, growth in the popularity rate, but now it's, it's uh, strongly dropped. And the first time that the combined opposition has a better result than it has been uh, before. Therefore, I have some slight and cautious optimism for the future that the populist can, can be uh, curtailed and curbed after the coronavirus. Thank you. Thank you very much, Istvan. Uh, well, the unfortunate news is that the policy failure of uh, populism is uh, costs human lives. So this of is course. which is. Okay. Uh, which is uh, which is terrible. Uh, we don't have very much time left. I just want to ask you if you could reflect on the EU veto issue and maybe uh, making your uh, closing uh, remarks. Please, Sharka, if you would continue. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think the, by uh, vetoing the EU budget and financial ad package, the Hungarian and Polish governments have taken a decisive anti-EU and anti-democracy stance and uh, moved further towards an uh, agilist uh, policy in terms of uh, dealing with the pandemic and with the EU. Um, the financial aid package uh, comes uh, with uh, stipulations uh, that states uh, must uh, uphold the rule of law standards of democracy in order to access uh, the almost 1.5 trillion euros in aid. And um, the right-wing populist uh, governments have uh, steadfastly opposed uh, the stipulations used as a benchmark, uh, calling it a power move. Uh, and uh, uh, power move by a European oligarchy and uh, have refused to accept these terms. And from uh, EU point of view, the stipulations are a means of uh, unification and um, uh, like uh, setting standards to protect to the rest of the world However, from uh, individual member states, the move can be seen as a grab for power and a direct infringement on sovereignty. Uh, this conflict means an uh, impasse in Brussels and now the citizens and governments of Europe are having to manage without a much needed financial package uh, to prop up their economies and moving forward past the second wave and uh, maybe into the third uh, wave in uh, 2021, the European economies will not survive on the international stage unless they can prop up their economies. And as we have seen in the second wave, uh, financial package is desperately needed now more than ever. And for the future of Polish and Hungarian EU membership, this may be the 
push their respective populist governments needed to exit the EU. This uh, in base uh, is a practical and uh, political issue. However, it's uh, rooted in philosophy. Uh, are the political ideologies of the two governments uh, worth foregoing the desperately needed economic relief and potentially being wholly excluded? Are citizens of these two states uh, willing to suffer in terms of employment and reduced uh, economic accessibility in support of populist politicians and uh, their anti-EU agendas? Do the citizens uh, have a choice in the matter when both states are effectively one party system and in uh, control of much of the media? Uh, these are all uh, pertinent questions that have only been exemplified by the arrival of coronavirus and the need for immediate action, economic and otherwise. Thank you very much, Sharka. Natasha, how do you see uh, this conflict? Uh, just uh, briefly, please, because we are uh, run out of time, unfortunately. Yeah, five Slovenian MEPs from different European political groups believe uh, any solution regarding the EU's uh, recovery package in the wake of Poland and Hungary's blockade must stay within the framework of a compromise on the rule of law. Uh, reached by the European Parliament and the Council of the EU. Uh, now, I am sure both Hungary and Poland, as you have all said, are very much aware of uh, what a veto would mean. I am also afraid of a compromise. Um, you know, uh, Slovenia is also one of the countries that get more than they pay uh, to the European Union. Um, no doubt Slovenian Prime Minister and Slovenia uh, with him uh, will pay a political price in years to come uh, for uh, certain actions uh, lately as uh, the letter to the EU. Uh, without the EU money, it will be even more difficult to uh, deal with the consequences of the crisis. Well, the thing is that for some time now, we have been witnessing a very dangerous trend of uh, breaking the unity of the European convoy. Uh, for leaders with authoritarian tendencies who like to ignore the will of the people, trample on human rights, destroy uh, democratic institutions and the rule of law, a strong EU is, of course, not their priority. Uh, now, Putin, Erdogan, Trump uh, have or have had problems uh, with EU, with the economically strong EU. Why? Because it's easier to manipulate isolated states than a powerful bloc. Now, uh, this was also one of the missions of Trump's ex-advisor, Bannon, who tried to organize the anti-EU bloc uh, before uh, the EU elections. So I do hope uh, that uh, populism, uh, looking uh, at the US elections, um, you cannot say we have rooted it out, but uh, it seems that uh, the uh, current American president paid the price. And looking at the case of, let's say, New Zealand, uh, the Prime Minister Ardern got a historic support uh, and has been uh, elected again. So uh, I am not very optimistic, though, uh, you know, uh, we need to, to hope for the best and work toward uh, getting the best results of uh, where we are today. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, <clears throat> Blazaj, the Polish government uh, didn't close the casinos. And they, now they are gambling with, uh, with, the, with the political veto of the EU budget. How do you see the possible outcomes of this conflict? Yes, this is a gambling game, but I, I will express this very shortly. The uh, European Union cannot go to compromise uh, on the basis of rule, rule of law. Uh, this is something really important. So uh, EU has to defend rule of law and fundamental rights and the basis that European uh, Union is, is built. And we should be absolutely clear about it. Uh, I think that it would be a great problem for uh, both Kaczynski and Orban if they will try to, to really make a veto uh, and stop, stop these funds for, for our countries. Uh, 
and the rule of law is something absolutely fundamental for the whole our community and there is no compromise about this and this is just my short statement thank you very much Paje. uh we hope that, uh, that this is actually the opinion of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, mainstream political decision makers uh it actually would be time also for the european people's party to to, to finally reconsider uh, actually the state of, of the Fidesz party in, in their party family because uh, they are uh, actually not sharing the same values as did the European funding fathers, for example. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much for uh, uh, accepting the invitation to this conference. Uh, if we are not uh, uh, taking home a big package of optimism, I think it's very interesting to see the possible outcomes uh, of, uh, of how populism fails in, uh, in protecting people, in uh, handling the crisis and putting forward uh, the, uh, their uh, selfish interests. And also, which is still more important, is uh, propaganda and political communication and not uh, good governance. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, uh, for uh, our audience. We are going to continue uh, this series of, uh, of Republican um, conferences. Next week on Thursdays, we are going to have another conference. And at that time, we are going to discuss feminism. Uh, thank you very much for our panelists once again. Uh, and uh, we hope that we are going to meet uh, possibly in 2021 uh, on site and not online. Thank you. Thank you. For thank the you. Time. See you. Goodbye.